I uh, aspired to play with uh, incredible musicians, and in doing that, I uh, listened to so many recordings and uh, anything I could get a hold of, videos or old TV shows or something, which we didn't have a lot of when I was a kid. It was dropping the needle in the same spot on the 33 and the third LP to transcribe uh, a certain segment of, of what you're trying to get. Uh, so you, I think you had to earn it a little, a little more then than just have all the, the computer and the YouTube and the DVDs readily available. Uh, you had to kind of earn it that way. Uh, but the musicians that, um, that I aspired to play with needed musical drummers. And I was drawn to that because as I, I had mentioned earlier to you that uh, I grew up in a, a technical snare drum world as a kid. So it was easy to go into the Buddy Rich, Gene Krupa, Louis Belson style of drumming. You applied the rudiments around the drums and it, it was pretty easy for me to, to do that. That was my introduction to the drum set just from snare drumming. Um, I took all of the technical side of those three gentlemen that I just mentioned and I don't mean to imply that they weren't musical drummers. I'm just talking about their solos is where I went with that. So I had to learn how to play time as they did, or like they did. Um, you know, Gene Krupa, great, one of the greatest time fields with the Benny Goodman Quartet. There wasn't a bass player, you didn't miss it. Uh, Buddy Rich with the uh, Oscar Peterson Trio, playing brushes all night, you know, people don't know about that. Um, Louis Belson was Oscar Peterson's favorite drummer of all time. Not because of the solos necessarily, although he loved those, but he loved the way he played time with Oscar. So uh, I had to learn those sides of the drumming, and I think by, by having heroes like Shelley Mann, who we've talked about before, um, Mel Lewis was another huge influence, probably my main influence, along with John Von Olin that I studied with, uh, <clears throat> stress time feel, the importance of your groove and your beat, and offering it to others. And whatever technique you have, use that technique to get your ideas out, your musical ideas out, not to sit down and do a rock'em sock'em solo and blow the windows out. So I think, um, I think by listening to those uh, early recordings and getting the, uh, the mentorship from the right people that I mentioned led me to that path. And I, you said something, I'm not sure if you realize how deep that is of what you said, there are drummers who play drums and there are musicians who happen to play drums. And I think we can all tell a difference when, when, you know, when we spot the drummer right away. Okay, this is a drummer that has a job in the band as a drummer. This other guy is a musician who chose the drums. So uh, it's really obvious to, to me and I think, um, I think uh, you know, sometimes drummers get a bad rap because um, you know, a lot of gigs want the drummers to come in and be drummers. On the, on the bit. They don't want them to be musical. They don't want to, they, you know, you lay down a foundation and build the house, you know, that we're going to, that we're going to be on top of. So, uh, but in jazz and, and more musical uh, approached uh, gigs, I think, I think um, we're all looking for a little more musical side of that musician that, that, that owns the drum set. Yeah. Their influence on me <clears throat> was quite different uh, from each other. Uh, there was a bit of a rivalry between them because of the studio work in the 50s in Los Angeles. And you know, Shelley had just gotten off the Stan Kenton band, as many of the Kentonites did, and went right into the studio work. And before that, it had been all classical musicians. So here, was, here, here were road rats that had been on the bus playing Stan Kenton music decided they could live in Los Angeles and be a part of the, the, the studio work and stay in one place, you know, have a nice house and go to work every day and play pretty good music in the studio. Um, so Shelley was uh, older than Mel and was on the Kenton band before Mel was on. So there was a, there was a bit of, uh, a, I think, more rivalry from Mel than there was Shelley, because Shelley was, was one of the you know, top call drummers. And then when Mel got off the Kenton band, Shelley had, had already done a lot of that work. Shelley also had a great studio musician mentality. 
Mel Lewis was a jazz drummer mentality who would walk into the studio and tell them how they were going to record him that day, you know, instead of just going in and saying, okay, the front head comes off the drum, okay, you know, and, uh, and Shelley was okay with that, you know, uh, to a point. I mean, he had his own ideas about the music, uh, how it should be played in the studio, but, but he played the Love Boat theme, for example. You know, I mean, he did a lot of, a lot of studio work where you didn't have to know it was Shelley Mann. And Mel Lewis was the, of the of, of much like me is that's why I don't do studio work is that I have an idea of how this thing should go and if you called me, then let me do what I do and um, that's not necessarily what studio work is about. So I think I think they had a little bit of a rivalry um, in the studio in the studio world and that's eventually why Mel uh, moved to New York in the uh, mid 60s to start Thad Jones Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra and do some work there. Shelley's influence on me came from his brush playing and his melodic drum solos. You could hear melodies that he played on the drums. His um, his uh, infinite search for yet another sound that he hadn't thought up by just flicking a little finger at the cymbal uh, bell or using his fingernails to scrape along the cymbal as, an, as a color, uh, mallet rolls with his hands instead of mallets on the cymbal, uh, playing with his hands on the drums. Um, um, all of those things were, were really uh, Things that I, a couple of those things I'd heard Papa Joe Jones do, and Ed Thigpen, Ed Thigpen later do, but Shelley was probably the second guy I heard play with his hands and play some of those uh, brush ideas. Uh, Papa Joe did a lot of that too, and I then and I think you know we all owe something to Papa Joe, and I know Shelley would agree to that. Um, I think uh, being a versatile, this is true for both Mel and Shelley now. Being a versatile drummer that you can be in a big band or you can play in a trio or you can play in a quintet, but you can do all of it and nobody will say, yeah, for a big band drummer, he's an okay trio player. Or for a trio player, he did an okay job in the big band. You know, the drummer owns the band in a big band, period. Woody Herman told me on my first night, he said, don't forget this is your band, pal. I'm 24 years old and it's like, but I don't want a band, you know. Tough. That, that was his lesson to me. This is your band, you can shade what you want and bring in the band when you want, set them up the way you want to. You're orchestrating from the drums for each section. So you have to think about, do I play a low sound to bring in the low bass trombone or do I want to go the other way and have contrast on a high sound to bring in the bass trombone? These are all things that Shelley and Mel did just instinctively. They just knew musically that they, those were the right things to do. So I learned a great deal about that from both of those gentlemen. Mel was a little less um, interested in jumping out with an idea, you know, or saying, here's what I got to play. And Shelley, she I felt like Shelley could do that a lot. And it's like, man, I've got a statement and I want you to hear what I'm doing. Mel would go, if you're smart enough and hip enough to listen to this, you'll understand what I'm doing. And, and so th that, it was just a difference in personalities, the way they approached what they did. A uh, few people didn't like Mel's solos. They couldn't, they couldn't stay with them. They were a little too abstract. And it, but if they were listening as a horn player would play that, then Mel was really hearing a horn solo through what he was doing. So you couldn't listen to him as a drum soloist. You had to think, if this guy played this on tenor saxophone, this would be phenomenal. And that was kind of that approach to what Mel took uh, on a solo. He wasn't into flashy paradiddles and rudiments. It was like, let me play, let me go blah, da da blah, ba boo be da 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 da. And he told a story that way instead of ba 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 da 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 ba ba da 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 He could do it, he chose not to. Mel said something interesting about technique also. Yeah, um, someone in a, in a magazine article put down Mel's technique and saying Buddy Rich had the greatest technique in the world and Mel Lewis didn't. And Mel took offense to that, and rightly so. And I sat in Mel's home when he told me this. He said, technique is something that we all have as individuals. Buddy Rich doesn't have my technique. He can't play what I play. 
I can't play what Buddy plays. So Buddy's technique works for what he does, but my technique is perfect for what I do. And I do have technique, and he did. I mean, he had sort of a side-to-side roly-poly rub-a-dub motion, and, and Buddy came from overhead, and it both served them well. When Buddy had his heart attack, who was standing in the wings at Wolf Trap ready to, to fill in in case, in case Buddy couldn't uh, uh, finish the gig? It was Mel Lewis. Buddy asked Mel to be there to fill in for him. So that's a great tip of the hat to, you know, and, and you know, the players, the players don't get into all this stuff. It's the magazines and the media that, that, uh, that, that say, oh, Mel has terrible technique. Mel had great technique. Mel had the greatest technique in the world for what Mel, Mel Lewis played and what he wanted to play. If he wanted to do something different, he would have tightened up and done whatever he wanted. But Mel wanted to play that way. So his technique served him very well. So technique isn't this one contest that we have a winner who has the best technique. You know, it's, that's, I thought that was really an insight into technique and how we can look at it. Mel's, uh, Mel's use of symbols. Uh, uh, Mel, uh, John Von Olin told me once, he said, you know, you can kind of categorize drummers into being cymbal players or drummers. And he said, Mel Lewis was a cymbal player. Every, everything he played came from the cymbals. It didn't come from the snare drum or bass drum. It came from the cymbals. And in fact, he would use the cymbals as drums. So he would play, if, he wouldn't just go boom, 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 boom. He'd go cymbal, 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 cymbal. And you get four different colors. And there was the statement. Now you've opened up the drum set to having eight voices in it instead of four drums and a crash on a cymbal. So now you open, you open up to eight voices, and if you use the bottom of the hi-hat, there's nine. So uh, every cymbal that Mel played was a crash cymbal, and it was also a ride cymbal. You know, if it's a good cymbal, then you can do both on it. And I think Shelley, as much as he liked the colors on cymbals, I think he was coming more from the drums. You know, so there's not a right and a wrong. There's not a bad or, or good out of this. It's just that's where their focus was, and I think that identifies them uh, in, in their style. I think it's accepted. I, 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 I think you can look at any university uh, now that has a jazz degree uh, and the percussion majors. I mean, you can, you, can, you can major in jazz drum set. You can walk out with a degree. So I, I think that in itself has said that it's, it's an accepted instrument now. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the uh, evolution of the instrument has come from the music and the musicians needing something else, for example, uh, the low boy, you know, the hi hat was down here, you know, mid calf. You couldn't play it with a stick. Papa Joe Jones wanted to hear, tsh, 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 and they had to raise it up so that you could get a hand on it and play it. So I think, I think the musicians and the music, as it changed, developed a drum set into what it is now. And so I, I think, uh, yeah, I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the you know, the stepchild of, of the music in, anymore. I think it's really, it, it's, it's its own voice. And certainly, how many great musicians have played this instrument that have, uh, that have put it on the map. So I, you know, I think it's, I think it's a, a grown up person now, you know, in our music world. In the wrong hands, any instrument can be, uh, you know, Sent off to the bedroom, but uh, you know. But I, I think uh, I think in the right hands, any instrument is uh, is certainly valid. Yeah. You know? So I don't think it's looked upon as, and if it is looked upon, it's it's those people's hang up with it. You know, it's like um, I have to tell a funny story of a band leader that we would all know, but I can't say his name. Uh, I was subbing for Nick Ciroli one night on on this band, and and. Uh, Everybody's warming up, and Marshall Royal and Bill Watrous, and a great band, you know. And I'm just warming up with brushes before it starts. And it's a dance. I first got the tent, so the leader comes up and he slaps my bass drum. <laughs> he says, put those away. You won't need those on my band. And I just looked at him and said, you haven't heard me play them yet. And his eyes kind of spun around, and he turned around and walked away, you know. So... I played him on one tune, and he never knew that I played him on that tune. You know, so but it's just the you know our hang-ups as as sometimes we look at, 
okay, there's there's five cymbals in that drum set. That drummer's going to be too loud tonight. You know, so we go in with these ideas that we're not going to like it before anybody even plays it. So the people who don't think that the drum set has uh, become its own instrument and accepted, that's, that's their problem. <laughs> so you have to let the musician at least say, you know, let me... Let, let me hang myself here before you do it. You know, let, let me give me enough room to, to, to either to, let me let me convince you you don't like me. You know, <laughs> I think uh, uh, there's, there's a lot, lot to answer that. But I think one of the simplest approaches is to sing everything that you want to play, and emulate the way you're you're. Uh, singing it don't just if uh, you know a lot of times you hear um, somebody in a, in a jam session will go okay oleo drummer you got the you got the melody and you'll hear the drummer go da 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 ba ba da ba da da ba da ba da ba da ba da 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 ba da 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 symbol symbol da da ba 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 da he's just playing the rhythm of oleo but he's not playing the melody or or trying to follow ascending and descending lines of the melody Da da da, so mounted tom, floor, snare, ba ba da, da da da. Now you're following that ascending line of the, uh, or the, the jumpiness of the line, and you're you're kind of asking the audience to go on this journey with you, even though you have four drums, that you're you're nailing all these pitches. So I think don't just play the rhythm, play, try to follow the line of your instrument. Uh, that's the that's the musical line of the melody. I also think phrasing is important. Not, not when you hear a saxophone player play a line, they're swallowing some of the notes. Not every note is the same volume, and drummers can can fall into that trap because we're striking an instrument. So the stick height is the same on every. You don't have to do that. Ba bu da ba bu da. So fall, so ghost that second note. Da lower. You know the, the lower lower volume, and play dynamics within your phrasing. If you're coming from a technical background with rudiments, learn to play those rudiments around a drum set like Philly Joe Jones did with the Charles Wilcox and you know, was just, that was his, his man. So you play a rat a cue, then ghost some of those notes and, 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 and crescendo through the end of the rudiment. And, and hide a low and make it a musical phrase. And, I always have to laugh when somebody says, "Was that a double paradiddle?" I go, "I don't know. Let me let me stop and say, yeah, it was. You know, but I didn't I didn't think of it as that. You know, I thought it was not So you sing the line and you start playing that way instead of technically going you know machine gunning everybody with the same volume on everything. I feel like it's it's always uh, changing because you are searching, and you're searching because you surround yourself with great musicians that you get to play music with. And if you're listening and you're smart enough to listen to them, then you're all on that journey together. And, and on any given night, that direction will go a certain way, and it and it perks your ears up, and you have to serve the music. You've got to meet the challenge of what the other musicians are doing. And I, and I think that's one of, the, one of the secrets is always play with great musicians. And they can be as good as you or better than you, but, but never play with musicians that aren't up to your standard because they're going to keep pushing you without meaning to. I mean, you as a group are going to keep going, hey, well, we haven't gone here before. Let's go here. And everybody's got to meet the challenge. If somebody doesn't that night, they're going to be there the next night because they had to think about it, you know, getting their butt handed to them on the bandstand. It's like, okay, I got to work on this. I'm going to have it tomorrow night. And that's, that's the challenge of this music. You never can get lazy in this music because there's always something around the corner that's going to punch you right in the nose. If you, if you start thinking you've got it covered, look out because the next eight bars, something's going to, going to nail you, you know, if you're playing with great players. I also think boredom, you know, can set in, and I, I don't like to see uh, musicians who, who just sort of um, 
are comfortable doing what they're doing and they know it works and so they're going to do that because they know it's it's uh it's going to get them the next gig and it's gotten them this far so well this is good enough you know and i think i think we all can kind of see when that happens in certain players and that's one of the things about shelly that was always interesting you know it's like and some things i thought he was way out on you know I thought, wait why is he doing this like the peter gunn you know the avant-garde albums but he was always searching and at the time when i heard those i wasn't there i wasn't ready to hear that but he was and so he he made you sort of listen to him like this like wow i need to check this out because i'm not sure where he's where he's going with this that's the learning and the, and the need to, to always challenge yourself musically. Not just for the sake of challenge, but you got to hear where you're going with this music and, and what your voice is in the music with the players you're playing with. <laughs> he was, uh, yeah, he was, he was one of the funniest people I knew. And, um, and, and, on the bandstand, I mean, he he was serious. Uh, I, this is another thing I learned about, I learned from him. He was serious about his music, but he didn't take himself too seriously. And I think that's a big difference. There are a lot of jazz musicians that I think take themselves way too seriously, and they forget that we're in the entertainment business. You know, for example, like we talked about before, that. Um, you know, we we are entertaining here. People are paying twenty twenty five dollars to come in and hear you tell them what kind of day you had so you know you know I don't mean entertain me I don't mean that but I do I, I do think that we as artists have to keep the audience in mind and what do I want to, if I'm in the audience what do I want to hear next what am I looking for next if do I want a song in the same key that I just heard and the same beat and what you know so I think we have to keep that in mind as musicians that these people came in to hear us, you know, and, and I don't want to dumb down and I don't want to, if they've just been listening to Top 40 radio every day, they might be out of luck, but but maybe I can bring them into my world for a minute and that's what they're in here for and, and I'm going to keep them in mind while I play the music. I'm not going to turn my back on them. Mm -hmm. 